This is 1010 Wins. You give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world. Good morning. 64 degrees at 8 o'clock. It's Tuesday, September 11th. I'm Lee Harris. Here's what's happening. It was a gorgeous day. And uh, it's a beautiful view of the Statue of Liberty. I got up and I remember walking outside and saying how bright it was. Well, September 11th was a very beautiful day. Gorgeous. I got to my desk uh, as I normally do around 8.30 in the morning. My office was located in Tower 1 on 86th floor. I just, you know, took a look out the window because the, the view was beautiful. You could see, like, you know, miles and miles away. My eye, like, just, I think by accident, caught a plane coming at us. In my mind, it looked like it was coming directly at my windows. I was standing there petrified. I just I didn't move. I just looked at the plane. The next thing, you know, the plane is hitting the tower. I, I thought it was going to fall right over into the, the Hudson River. I said, this is going to fall over. This is it. The building uh, shook very, very violently. There's papers flying outside my window, and the building just rocked. It was screaming, and people got knocked out of their shoes. I just you know, stood there without um, moving, you know, and I just, I just watched. I thought it was my last moment, you know, just, you know, what would you do? You don't run, you don't hide. Just into our newsroom, a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. Right, I'm looking at the World Trade Center, and there's a huge hole in it, and there's a fire in the building. If you're a New York City firefighter, you are ordered to report to your station at this time. All of a sudden, the windows in the sky rise just blow out. It was an incredible force of air blasting these windows out. And, went, and paper and, and all sorts of things just started coming out, and they never stopped coming out. So we left on the west side stairwell. A second plane the size of a passenger jet flying into the second tower of the, of the World Trade Center. As we got into, the say, the, the mid-40s, you heard, move to the right, firemen coming out. It's a... Uh, Probably the best thing you could ever hear at that stage. Tintin wins correspondent John Fleischer on the scene in Lower Manhattan. Uh, any emergency personnel? Oh my God! The building fell. Oh my God! The building just fell. Oh my God! Oh my God! And it was loud, and that building shook. And it went black. On September 11th, nearly 3,000 souls were murdered in a brief, astonishing moment of terror when New York's Twin Towers crumbled to the ground in clouds of fire and dust. Lost were mothers and sons, waiters and window washers, fathers and daughters, stockbrokers, cops, and firefighters. By day's end, 343 firefighters who climbed into the towers while everyone else ran out failed to return to their firehouses. This is the story of a house in the Bronx. The story of Rescue 3, one of five rescue squads spread over the boroughs of New York. On September 11th, when the alarm came, all New York's rescue squads and over a hundred ladder and engine companies made it to the towers within minutes. At 8.45, Rescue 3 took the call. Eight men left for Lower Manhattan. None would return. Rescue 3 is not much different from any house. Only it's a house of men. 
Lieutenant Martha, Nick, Bobby, Cliff, Mike, Bill, and Mickey. A brotherhood. A family that cooks and fights, sleeps and dreams together. Like all families, they've had their losses. Eleven years ago, they lost a man in a building collapse. The street they live on is named after him. That's the uh, riding list uh, on September 11th. Now a piece of plexiglass preserves the last ride list of eight lost men. That's a tribute to all of them, and that's going to stay there. Captain Hickey, Ray Meisenheimer, Chris Blackwell, Donnie Regan, Joe Spore, Tommy Gambino, Tom Foley, and Jerry Schrang will always be part of Rescue 3. God bless each and every one of them. Signal 5, 5, 5, 5 has been transmitted. For weeks now, since the attack, the 5555 five, five, five signal comes across the computer screen of every firehouse in New York. Each message brings confirmation of another dead firefighter. As a result of injuries sustained while operating at Manhattan Box 558087, Ronald, may you rest in peace. Over 70 years ago, New York's rescue squads were created to rescue firefighters. Today, they're an elite team that uses special tools to pull victims out from under subway cars and from elevator shafts, from beneath burning cars and collapsed buildings. But on September 11th, their tools were of little help. The most uh, important tool that we carry is the one we carry on our shoulders, is our head. That you have to think. You have to be able to think and come up with solutions to take this out. There was no training for that whatsoever. Right? What happened on September 11th? Would you have done anything different? Uh, probably all went in <clears> just <throat> like everybody else did. Like you said, people in there need help. You got to get in there and help them out as best you can. Right. I don't think any firefighter in the country is going to do the same thing. Yeah. And there was no indication of a collapse in the first tower. From everything that you know, we're hearing from guys who survived. The first indication, it was, it was over, you know. Those who survived, luck, the grace of God, you know. As we always say, uh, expect the unexpected, but sometimes the unexpected gets you, and that's what happened. Nobody expected that. For Rescue 3, any one of some 50 runs a week brings the unknown. Rescue 3 is a squad that goes out without a ladder, without water. They're the rescue specialists who join their ladder and engine brothers at the scene. I've always said it. We have a terrible profession. The only way we hone our skills are to go to fires. Fires wreck havoc and destruction upon people. The only way we get better at it is going to them and working at it, learning how to do, put out fires, and suppressing fires. But people suffer. They lose property, they lose lives, loved ones. It's tough. Now we have this break in our processes sitting around we're getting to go out to emergencies and fires, which is good. The guys need to go out and start getting back to a routine. Our, our lives have been either going down to the World Trade Center working on a pile, or going to our brother's funerals. And it's been like that since September 11th. And uh, you know, when you have 343 people to, to memorialize, you try and make as many as you can, we have to do it. You know, it's part of our brotherhood. Today, the men of Rescue 3 stop by a neighborhood church to mourn another brother.
people ask you, things are the same. Well, people have to realize things are never going to be the same. All we can do is hope to get back to some normalcy and uh, reach out and bring in new people and keep the tradition going. It's going to be a long haul, but I'm sure we're going to be able to deal with it and take care of business. The firefighters who ran into the burning towers had one singular goal, to evacuate civilians. For the thousands who wound their way down the never-ending stairs to freedom, the appearance of firefighters coming up was their first sign of hope. It was really, really reassuring to see the firefighters because seeing the firefighters, this was uh, the first, um, they were the first people from the outside the towers that we had seen. First of all, they have radios. They have hoses and other equipment. They have oxygen. They have flashlights. And I knew the fifth thing, this is what I'm thinking about, the fifth thing was, if they could get up, then I could get down. The first to be brought down were the injured. But soon, the injured stopped coming. Still, the firefighters continued up on their mission of hope, floor by floor. And each step is very hard for them to do. I mean, 44 flights in normal gym shorts would be hard for the average person. 40 flights, each firefighter carrying 100 pounds of gear. They were only halfway up to the burning floors. One of them dropped their gear in this tank and looked up, and he's sweating, just sweating. And he's, you know, sucking wind. And he was just like, just like a guy I would want to hang out with, just a normal guy. And he goes, hey, can anybody help? So I said, sure, I'll give you a hand. And I grabbed some of his gear, and I started up. And we finally made it up to, let's say, the 39th, 40th floor and I opened up the door, and on the radio, one of the fellows who was standing said, we have two firemen down with massive chest pains. And I said, oh, shook. So I said, what can I do? What can I do? And they said, can you get us any water? So I said, sure, no problem. So I gave him two bottles of water. I gave it to him and I said, guys, I gotta go. There's not much more I can do. I don't know CPR and I really gotta go. I mean, I, I gotta get down again. Inside the 30th floor stairwell, Stoby heard a tremendous noise, like thunder. It was the first tower coming down. Everything went black. And I just remember singing like, you know, this is like no way to die. And I cannot believe I'm not gonna see my kids again. And there was a fireman nearby and on his radio, it's a, you could hear major collapse, major collapse. And just heard major collapse. Get out, get out. Brian Stoby was one of the last to make it out. Eight minutes later, his tower fell. It can't fall. It just, don't, it can't fall. And it had just fallen. I said, there's so many firemen in there. It can't fall. There's three guys who just saved my life. It can't fall. The New York Fire Department helped to evacuate 25,000 people. But thousands never had a chance. 
including the firefighters Brian Stobie said goodbye to on the morning of September 11th. Though the eight men of Rescue 3 did not return home, their truck did, surviving the collapse with only a smashed windshield and some scratches. Uh, we're going to... Okay, if you get in there, we got a lot of people. Horses Road and Wilkins Avenue. bunch of calls on it and it seems legitimate, it seems like it's a fire, they'll send the rescue on it. They'll start them out and by the time the companies get there to investigate, they find out it's, it's not a fire, maybe just a fire or stove or something, so they return us. They, they overreact on the side of safety, it's a good thing. This morning's call, like so many, turns out to be just a smoking frying pan. Always in uniform, always on call, their truck shadows them on the streets of the Bronx. You want to go with these guys so you can order your sandwich for lunch? I'm going to be buying dinner. What did you have? I need uh, two uh, please. Give me the biggest ones you got. I've got a couple. Which... Thanks. Let's make a Brussels sprouts tonight. So you guys have to eat all your greens. In the fire service, you sleep with each other. You eat, you cook each other's meals, you clean up. It's just like being at home. We have to support ourselves. We have to clean, we have to wash dishes, we have to do our laundry. We have to maintain things like that. And it just makes it another arm of another family. The times are good, we get out there and we uh, support one another, and we have a good time. When the times are bad, we band together and we give each other support. And that's what's happening now. Rescue three, Kanabi. Ah, he's in the kitchen right now. You know, we don't want to hold him up. Yeah, we'll put him on. Don't talk to him too long, though. <laughs> Chow's almost on. Nick has been a firefighter for over 18 years, much of it with Rescue three. At the time of the attack, he was working a desk job for the fire department. But after September 11th, the surviving brothers of Rescue three needed Nick back at the house. I'm 51. I know it's a young man's job. I mean, I'm in my, my, the rescue. It's good. It's not that I can't do the job. It's just that, you know, maybe give the young guy an opportunity. Chow's on. Chow's on. Come and get it. For Lieutenant Murtha and his men, life goes on. Meals get made. But the reality of their loss never leaves them. Six weeks after the disaster, the men of Rescue 3 watch a friend's home videotape of September 11th. In the sudden silence that followed the collapse, dozens of piercing chirps echoed through the rubble. For when a firefighter is motionless for too long, an alarm attached to his gear begins to sound off. That day, the chirps seem never to end. You can see by watching the movie, this is the first time I'm watching it. It took a lot of guts to go into those buildings knowing that they had that amount of fire but that amount of explosion, the size of the aircraft, I'm sure it was on everybody's minds before the first one went down that there's a good possibility that it was gonna come down on them. And they all went in. in hindsight's 2020, you want, like, uh, they say that the, there'll be a lot of things we don't know. The guys would've went back in the building. I mean, they, they'll prepare. Let's say they just prepare for this if it happens again. Some kind of bombing or something like that. They'll be cautious, but somebody still has to go in and get those people out. That's our job. After the attack, 
surviving firefighters from all over the city went down to the pile to dig for their own. And for the first week, none of us gave up hope that we were going to have that miracle and pull one of them out alive. And unfortunately, that wasn't to be, but everybody was there to do that. There was a lot of cases like that. We would, you'd look around to your left and your right, you'd see fathers looking for their sons. You'd see sons looking for their fathers. You know, you'd see brothers looking for their brothers. Um, the fire department's a tight-knit family. The brother, the father, and the cousin of Rescue Three's Tom Foley joined in the search. They dug with us side by side, and on the 11th day, that night, Danny actually found his brother. Digging in the debris, actually found the bone that Danny or uh, Tommy had surgery on, and they were able to identify him through his x-rays. And what a comforting thing to see that. I mean, if there was ever a happy ending to a horrible story, to see Danny find his own brother, it was like finding a needle in a haystack down there. The first night I was at his house and he made a promise to his mother, Mama, I'm gonna bring him home. And he did, he brought him home. We're all here for each other, but it's never gonna be normal. And for those of us who lost so many great friends, you know, to lose one friend is devastating. To lose as many as we lost, nobody could even picture these numbers. After September 11th, the days of disbelief began. One dark day following another. The Brotherhood of Firefighters was devastated. The number of missing and dead began to grow. Engine 40, Manhattan, six men missing. Ladder Company 101, Brooklyn, seven men. Three men from Battalion 12 in the Bronx. Angelini, O'Rourke, Henderson, Freund, Mendez, Sikorsky. The names would go on and on, reaching the incomprehensible number of 343 men unaccounted for. New York's firefighters were not the only community demolished. The city reeled. And like the rest of the nation, the city barricaded itself in. Right now, People were barred from their homes in Lower Manhattan. Streets blocked. The island became a fortress. Bridges closed. Buildings locked down. The shattered city found solace in gathering together to sing and pray for miracles. I'm helping, I'm putting up. Faces of the beloved missing were taped to every wall and supermarket window. On the site were two mammoth buildings once etched their grand stature into the nation's heart. A pile of twisted steel smoldered. As the days and weeks passed, the possibility of life grew dim. Then, as the badges and helmets and charred jackets of New York's firefighters emerged from the pile. The funerals and the mourning began.
Ten days after the attack, firefighter Jerry Schrang was found. He was the first to be buried from Rescue 3. Those who lost loved ones on September 11th have no concrete place to return to. There is no office to visit, no belongings to sort through, just a vast empty setting of dust and debris where once two towers stood. But New York's firehouses remain standing. They have become sanctuaries. Within their walls, there is comfort and maybe a speck of hope. A place to go to, to remember a life. As a New Yorker, as an American, we all felt that we needed to do something and show you and express to you our feelings that we're behind you, we're united, and anything we can to help our community. Um. All you people here, I know you're all New Yorkers, a lot of you live in the Bronx, you're our people. Um, this means a lot to us, it really does. Thank you very much. Okay, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here to feed you, so I hope you're all hungry. Yeah, I think we got enough food. <laughs> In the family of firefighters, there exists a powerful bond. They are the world to each other. They live with each other for days on end, and when they return to their other families, still their lives intertwine. Soccer games, hunting, fishing trips, helping to build each other's homes and weekend cabins. Unfortunately, uh, three of those guys we lost right yeah. there in that picture. Yeah. I mean, Ray Meisenheimer, you know, just uh, Wally the Buff. Wally the Buff. Oh, that was hysterical. It was just, that was something. Those, cool. those were funny, those were funny, funny nights were when, funny. when he was on that kick. We used to sit here and have a nice dinner like we do in a firehouse. And, we poured a fresh cup of coffee, and Ray would pick up the phone, and uh, he'd call another firehouse. And, and it started out just being like hey, the Ray. rescue comes, <laughs> and uh, he'd say, "My name's Wally, and I'm a buff, and I want to widen your rescue truck." <laughs> and uh, it would just start. I'll tell you, if a guy hung up on him, he'd be calling him right back. <laughs> How about Donnie Regan? If he ever lost his life. Check my pocket, the winning lottery ticket will be there. <laughs> he always said <laughs> Joe Spohr. His father was a lieutenant in Rescue 3. I knew, I knew it was his dream to come here. He was just one of those guys that, you know, you could see he was going to be a star. What about the Shrang Man, eh? Jeremy. The Shrang Man. The class clown. When I was at 59, I didn't even know the guy. He was there on a detail. <laughs> and uh, I fl flushed the toilet. And the next thing you know, the water hits me right in the face. I'm like, whoa! You know, and then I found out, who did that? Shrang. I go, who is this guy, Shrang? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, Tommy Gambino. He's here, what, a year and a half? Year and a half. Did you grow up with him? Yeah, I went to high school with him. He was always fun. A lot of fun. Love to take his boy surfing all the time. He was, uh... Like that, he's a devout Catholic, like Bobby was saying, and you know, with that uh, old school little uh, yeah, old uh, Latin devout mass. Latin mass. No meat on Friday, but watch at 12 o'clock, man. He was in that refrigerator eating that steak. <laughs> <laughs> 12 or 1, you better not be in his way. You, you might get a junk out of your arm. <laughs> yeah, I miss Tommy. Yeah, well, I see so much of uh, Tommy and his two boys, Thomas and Brian. They're like clones. Yeah. It's good to see, you know what I mean? Yeah. This time he was good. You can see the apple then fall from the tree there. Two good guys. Janet Gambino and her sons, Tommy and Brian, have come to visit the house. 
a good smile on. <laughs> we'll get you those. They're on the uh, Mike Davis is down on a CD. Tommy's dad, an 18-year vet, had joined the squad just over a year ago. That's the drill we had. At 48, Gambino was looking at retiring in a few years. He transferred here. You know, he wanted to be part of the elite, which is this right here. He really loved it. He loved this place. If I'd never been here before, you know, I know that he spent so much time here, you know? And see the pictures and stuff. And it just, it got me, you know? It definitely got me. It's hard. Like thousands of others, Tommy Jr. watched a personal tragedy play out before his eyes. It went downstairs, my television I was watching. And when it collapsed, I just, I, I, I almost threw up. Because they had been, been saying that the rescue workers were all in there. And I was like, no, no way. No way. And, and. To, to watch it is just, to know that you watched it is just something that no person, especially knowing now that they were in there, just, and so many people did, so many people. It's not just me. It's just, it's not just my pain. Everybody watched it, you know? So many people were in there. I don't know. But they were all heroes. I personally just feel blessed that I even had a father like that. And that gives me comfort. But it doesn't take away the, the, the pain. Because you just want, you want that physical. You want that, that physical touch. You want that, the words. And he taught me a lot, but I could have learned so much more. Janet Gambino and Jerry Schrang's wife, Denise, are meeting for the first time. The guy holding the foam canister was Jerry. Exactly right what you see is here is what you see. Right after the In the movie. Uh-huh. No. He was in Third Watch. Third Watch. He was in a whole bunch of things. We got the letter in the mail. I looked through the envelope. I could see that he had been accepted. And we, you know, put this big celebration out for him. And he walked in the house. He was a truck driver, actually. And he walked in the house. And we just, he was three years old. And he was jumping all over the house. Dad, oh, dad, dad, wonderful. guess what? He was so happy, he was so excited. <laughs> I've been married to him for 25 years. He's been, July 11th was his 20th anniversary, and it was something that they loved to do. It wasn't something that he forced himself to go to work. He looked forward to going to work. He, he worked uh, 4th of July, he loved it. The Bronx always burns. I'm like, okay, fine, Jerry, whatever you wanna do, you know what I mean, but that was it. I have to just say something about Tommy, that he lived I learned more about life from him than I could ever learn in a book or from anyone because his, he believed in living for the moment. Mm -hmm. He says, you have everything right. in the world. He says, and then he would stop and go, you never know when a tragedy could hit your family mm -hmm. and then your life will never be the same. We went to Pier 94 and three guys walked in in their gear yeah, and I'm, I'm like, like and they're like, you're making me have a complex. I'm like, I haven't smelled that smell in a month. I'm sorry. And they're like, are you all right? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. As the tears are rolling down my face, I'm like, just they that thought I was smell. nuts. It's it the was, smell. Even it's the fire habits. when you walk out that door, it's smoky, gross smell, but it smells good. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just I don't know. He's like, it would be nice to be a hero. He's like, it would be nice. He's like, He's like, but if you happen to be one of the misfortunate ones that perish in it, then you're just a number that's eventually just going to be a number. And he's like, I, all I think about when I go there is I just want to come home to you guys. Mm -hmm. He's like, I love the job. He's like, but my main thing is, when I, is when I come home to you. And that's, that, that, was the last, that was the last thing he said to me ever. You know, I don't know. It's hard. we got to keep going. Sometimes I don't even want to get out of bed in the morning. I just kind of lay there and go, why am I getting up? When is it going to hit you? Right. It, right. Like the grief. It hasn't hit me. So when does the other shoe fall? 
Excuse me. As I know now, I think about it, and I'm like, Daddy's not walking me down the aisle. Daddy's not doing this. So I'm gonna walk you down. <laughs> you don't get along with your brother. I know these guys will never forget. I don't think the world's ever gonna forget. It doesn't bring them back, though. It's hard. But we're strong, and like you said, we'll be brave just like they are. We have to be. And I love them all with my heart. Just to say the word goodbye would work. Yeah. Just once. On that unforgettable morning in September, when the sky fell on downtown Manhattan, the Brotherhood of Firefighters worked to find someone, anyone, alive. And like Rescue 3, every engine and ladder company that went into the towers had countless men missing. The world was waiting for a sign. Then, out of that hopelessness of smoke and flames, one small miracle, a signal from beneath the ruins. I got a Mayday transmission uh, from six truck, Captain Jonas. I told him we were in the North Tower, World Trade Center Tower number one. I gave the exact location of the stairway, what stairway we were in, between what floors, and uh, uh, the uh, one, one fireman replied to me, he says, where's the North Tower? And I was like, oh boy, we're, we're in trouble. They, they can't even find the North Tower. With orders to evacuate the North Tower, the six firefighters from Ladder 6 worked their way down stairwell B when it suddenly collapsed. And so this door flew open and uh, just missed my face, and it hit my helmet, knocked my helmet off, hit my shoulder, and then it hit the wall. And, and then now the force of the wind had blown me back, uh, on my back. Tremendous amount of rush of air coming from up above, down. I mean, it was just, it was like being in a wind tunnel. It was so fast and so hard. And I said a prayer real quick, and, uh, and I, waited, I waited to get crushed and get hit with something really big. But the blow never came. 110 floors of steel and concrete came crashing down around them, slamming into the ground at 120 miles an hour. The men of Ladder 6 were trapped in the only floors of the only stairwell left standing. But it was dark. You could taste. There was no breathing. It was just you know, like you were taking a bite out of the air. I mean, it was so hard and so much dust and debris. For every firefighter who had gone into the towers, there were dozens of loved ones waiting, praying for news. The house of Captain Jonas was no exception. They had gotten a phone call out on a cell phone when they were trapped. My husband's been on the fire department for a long time, in Rescue 3 and a lot of hairy situations. And I said, being trapped does not always mean you get out. And it wasn't until about 2.30 that I got a call from my nephew who said, I can hear him on the radio, they're out, they're heading to the hospital, and uh, I know he's safe. So uh, it was a very stressful day. <laughs> I saw another fireman, and uh, he had a cell phone, and I tried it again, and I was able to get through for a short uh, time. And uh, it was a short dialogue with my wife, because I kept saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. And she just kept saying, you're alive, you're alive, you're alive. And, and then we lost the signal. And then, uh, but at least she heard my voice. The men of Ladder 6 
along with a handful of Port Authority officers and one female civilian, would be the only people to emerge from the rubble alive. I'm sure we'll never know normal the way it was before. Uh, we'll normalize after a while. Uh, time heals all wounds. Um, it's going to be a long road, uh, without a doubt, but uh, we'll get to some semblance of normalcy. Again, it won't be like it was before. For the families of these few survivors, normal will never be the same. Imagine life for those whose loved ones will never come home. The daily routine forever lost. A house forever changed. To this house in the Bronx, eight men will never return. Men like Captain Brian Hickey, Ray Meisenheimer, and Chris Blackwell. Blackwell's three children and his wife Jane have come to visit Chris's firehouse. The time has come to clear out his locker. Eleven years of his life. Chris was always happy coming to work. He never walked around and bragged about what he did. Never. Hey guys, should I bring the shovel in? No, Mom. I never really looked at it that he was putting his life on the line like that. I just looked at it that he was, I don't know, he was doing his job. I always said he wouldn't do anything stupid. When somebody's worked somewhere for 20 years and they still love getting up every morning going to work, I'd rather see somebody happy. He was thrilled to bring Ryan. The guys down here love Ryan. Ryan has his own locker upstairs. Ryan Blackwell is 13 years old. Like his dad, Rescue 3 is his second home. He was the guy who sacrificed his life for anybody else's life, like any other guys here at the rescue. He's, uh, he's actually put his life in danger more than once. He's had over 11 citations, and he's been awarded three medals. So he's one of the most decorated guys in the department and one of the smartest. I think it would be an honor for me and my father would be truthfully honored that I would go and follow in his footsteps and do what he did. Because, not just because my father was killed in the line of duty, because I've always wanted to do it, been raised to do it. My mom thinks it's an honor that I want to come back here. And so do all the guys in this firehouse. Oh, he's loved it since forever. He's just, he just wants to be like his father. To this day, he still says he wants to be a fireman. And he's planning on coming right here to rescue three, too. His father was his world, you know? And this was part of his world, so at least his whole world isn't crushed, you know. He's still got a little bit left of it. And uh, when this thing happened, we, uh, I guess we all got a lot more sons. <laughs> I have two sons now instead of one, you know. That's why I figured. He used to come to work with his father a lot. And uh, he was so into it, you know what I mean? And, and we realize now that this is, this is the, the last piece. If he didn't have this, then his father would be gone forever. You know what I mean? And I guess he feels like he's... He probably feels he's not gone forever because he can still come here and hang out with us and he goes up in his locker. And, you know, he's got the key to the locker and he goes in his father's locker and stuff, so... Um, you know, it's, it's, it's... It's all he's got left of his father, you know? So... It breaks my heart, you know? I have a son. It breaks my heart. Sorry. 
you know, you go home and you actually sit down and start to think about it, and it hits you that he's never be coming home. But the one thing you have to remember is that he died doing the thing he loved to do, and he would have never wanted to die any other way. Just like all the other guys who went. Richard, your dad, Tommy Gambino's with him right next to him, right? Yep, Gambino Tom, and Tom Foley. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sunshine warm your face. The rain fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. You should save that. And then you park. That's why your dad put it there. It was special though. Tell me working a weekend. Okay. Three sweatshirts. Yeah, buddy. All right. See, look, one sweatshirt and two sweatshirts. Get on say, Go to school tomorrow, will you? We got to the corner with your dad's side. It's Saturday night in the Bronx. The midnight to 5 a.m. shift, just two months after the attack. For Rescue 3, the night is looking like many Saturday nights do. A subway accident. A house fire. And a car crash. It's a hard shift, but the night holds a comforting routine. It's a chance to do what they do best. Rescue. Somebody help him inside. The New York City Fire Department, I mean, let's face it, it's the largest city in the world, and, and you do face uh, life and death situations all the time. So I miss those guys. I miss, uh, I miss Ray and Chris Blackwell and Donnie Regan, and Tommy Foley and Tommy Gambino, Joe Spore, good people, all good people. It's not going to be normal. It's not going to be the same. As I try to tell the guys, just don't ever expect it to be the same. Those guys are gone, and we'll always remember them. The spirit is always going to carry you on. We're here for the surviving family members. We're here to let them know that they're part of the big family. And it's something we'll never, never let them forget. Four months after the tragedy, only two of the eight men lost from Rescue 3 have been laid to rest. Of the 343 New York City firefighters missing, only 138 have been found. <laughs>